Please unwrap your candies now. <laughs> from Samuel French. Thank you so much for joining us for the kickoff of Red Suite. We're thrilled that y'all are here. <laughs> this is a really great crowd, and on behalf of Howl Round and Samuel French, we want to say thank you, because it's very important subjects to be discussing. Um, just a few things. First of all, please silence your cell phones, but live tweet. I'm going to be right there. <laughs> so, and also, Howard's going to be taking um, questions from Twitter as well. So later there will be questions that y'all can ask, but if you have friends at home that are following along, feel free to have them tweet out. You in your hands, in addition to the program, and if you didn't get it, there are white papers um, about this exact subject from Samuel French, so take a look. And also you'll notice uh, on the board there and in your programs, we have three more great events coming up this week. There's also a lot of great essays on how round, so check them out. And uh, without further ado, we're going to turn it over to our moderator, Howard Sherman, and uh, kick it off. Thank you. Thank you. Since 2005, winners during the Guild and advising its 7,000 plus members and governing council. Uh, to uh, Ralph's right is Burke Brown, also with Wingspace Theatrical Design, recently in New York. Stay and Basilica, Ralph Stick Playwrights Theater, Phoebe and Winter at Club Thumb. Uh, his other, New York include, his other work in New York includes the 52nd Street Project, Ars Nova, New York Shakespeare Festival. Public Theater and La Mama, and his recent regional designs include Sayama Christina at the Magic Theater, Yentl at Cleveland Playhouse, and It's a Wonderful Life at Playmakers Rep. And last but not least, Beth Blickers is an agent at Abrams Artist Agency, where she represents artists who work in theater, opera, television, and film. Before Abrams, she was an agent at Helen Merrill and the William Morris Agency. Uh, she is a member of the Association of Authors' Representatives, the president of the Literary Managers and Dramaturgs of the Americas, and uh, the board chair emeritus of Theater Breaking Through Barriers, a New York company that works with artists with disabilities. So welcome to our panel. I'm going to start with, um, with Lee and, and Burke. Um, with seemingly a simple question, maybe not, um, which is how did you come to learn that as theater artists you had rights in your work? Was that something that came up? I don't know if I've learned that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, 
<laughs> then just listen. Yeah, no, I should be out there, I think. But, uh, I don't know, it's something we've talked about a lot, but I don't know if we know all the answers. Um, At any point in school, did anybody come and talk to you about <laughs> what your ownership of your work was? Uh, are you represented by agents? Oh, yeah. To talk to you about what you're right. <laughs> but well, what do you mean by right? It means well, in other words, that people can't come in and see something you've done and say, gee, that looks terrific, and just willy nilly replicate it on another stage in their own production without compensating you for that. Work. It's, a li it's hard to replicate, I would say. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I think part of what we talk about and, and this idea of own ownership is. Uh, is really tricky because it's hard to own an idea, and that's what sort of design is. I mean, I feel like I own um, the drawings that I do, the physical stuff, the models, the drawings, but it's hard to say you own a design. It's interesting. I, okay, so Beth, as an agent who represents designers, <laughs> <laughs> what, what would you say? I jokingly said, let's have a fight during this panel, but I didn't think it was going to happen on the first question. <laughs> take, it, take it slow. And I thought it was going to be Ralph and I. <laughs> <laughs> now I have to fight with people I don't know. Um, I, I would respectfully encourage you to have a stronger sense of what you are worth, dare I say, and what your designs are worth. And if this has not yet happened to you, I suspect it will at some point, where you design a Lucy Thurber play at Rattlestick Playwrights Theater, and you're trolling around Facebook or the internet one day, and a theater is producing the same play, and you look at their design or their production photos, and you say, well, that's really funny. The door is in the same place. The bookcases are in the same place. They have that same weird ball of twine in the exact same location on the bookshelf. Um, you know, the, the lights are coming through the exact same location of the window. Um, and weirdly, you know, we put that character in an orange dress and, and their character is in an orange dress. And all of a sudden, it starts to become very clear that no, you cannot copyright an idea or own an idea. You can only own and copyright the expression of an idea. But where that placement of that door and that window and the color of that dress and how you set decorated that bookshelf are owned by you. And there have absolutely been examples, some of them very well known, of people putting photos side by side and you know the facial hair being identical. That is not a fluke. Um, you work really hard, and at a lot of theaters, especially in New York, you work for very little money. And in truth, most artists, if a theater contacted them and said, we loved your set so much, we would like to duplicate it, and we would like to pay you for permission to do so, but we're tiny and our tickets are only $10 and we don't have a lot of money, you would probably work with that theater at a very rational level and say, okay, why don't you pay me this and use my design? Um, so I, I would say stand firm and make people pay because artists can only afford to have careers when artists are being paid for what they create. So let's expand on that. <laughs> we started from design. You represent variety of artists in the theater. Um, artists all, you hear, I need to get an agent. I want to get an agent. Um, let's say they get an agent, mainly you. Um, and certainly you have the conversation about how you're going to seek work and suggest work, et cetera, et cetera. But do you, do you have a conversation about their rights when, say, you're now the agent there, let's say it's a playwright, a designer, going out to do their first show that you're representing them on. Beyond making sure they get their travel and housing, et cetera, et cetera. What do you talk about in terms of them understanding what their rights are when they go out to do that work? I think for the initial production, it's usually 
helping them understand what can and cannot be changed about their work. Uh, that if you're a playwright and you show up in rehearsal one day and act two, scene one has been cut without your permission, that cannot happen. Uh, if the can, it just should. Well, touche, <laughs> 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 Mr. Seven. We'll, we'll, we'll get to you, Ralph. <laughs> uh, I have examples. Um, I've had directors leave after the show is opened and get emails from their cast saying, oh, the artistic director showed up and restaged three scenes in act two. Um, I don't know if I've ever actually had like set pieces cut or changed. I think, you know, once. Okay, well then that's what that happens too. So, so it is about encouraging people to advocate for themselves and to understand that that is an actual contractual point. Their contract, any contract I negotiate, and especially in writer's agreements, it's getting longer and longer and longer, has a very specific language saying what can't happen. I now have language that says you cannot add, remove, or relocate intermissions within the play because theaters were taking intermissionless plays and adding intermissions, and I was reading reviews saying, I loved this play. It's just a little weird. The top of Act Two is sort of rocky and strange, and you think like that's because there's no top of Act Two. <laughs> you know. So where I think your question actually comes into play is the subsequent productions where the author is not around, um, and this is getting harder and harder. Sort of easier to police, but in some ways harder to address. Is you know people who cast an older actor and he can't retain all the lines so they break the role across two performers. That has happened. People who felt the ensemble players didn't have enough to do so they wrote more lines for them. Uh, that has happened. Uh, a play where the playwright said, all the women are played by individual actors, all the men are played by one actor, and in an author's note in the acting edition explained why and then we saw a casting notice casting all of the men individually. Um, you know, we live in the day and age of the internet. You will very likely get caught. You would be amazed how many aunts and uncles show up at shows written by their nieces and nephews. You will get caught. Um, and it is about saying to clients, um, you should have been asked, and if you're asked, you're allowed to give any answer. I've approved the editing out of foul language. I've approved a drinking game with alcohol being changed to soda. Um, but there are also things my clients have said to me, you know, I've written this play for certain racial uh, roles for actors, and before we publish it especially, I've said, now are you okay if somebody wants to do this, all Caucasian, all African American? And sometimes they say, it can be anything, and sometimes they say, no, I wrote it with that very specific intent. Um, it can then be hard to make sure theaters do it that way, and I would love for that to be a conversation at some point during this week, but it, I don't feel schools are educating them to loop back to your question, and it absolutely is the role I mean, of the agent to make that clear. Yeah, and, and that's the best thing about agents. Like, part of me doesn't want to know. Like, part of me wants to just be a designer and, and focus on my work and working on new plays and developing ideas. And, like, if somebody copies it, they... You know, at least um, it says to me that we did something right, you know? And, and there's been a number of times, especially working on new plays, where it's, it's, it's very hard to draw the line about whose idea it was, and it gets baked into the final product, and then if it's a hit or it's successful, undoubtedly the next production will take elements of that because it worked. Mm -hmm. And that's been done with Tennessee Williams, that's been done with Arthur Miller, that's been done with every great playwright. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I, um, I think it's easy to get all hot and bothered about it, but at the same time, it's a testament to good design. Uh, when, uh, when there's a, you know, a legacy. You know, sometimes work is just inherent. I mean, design or direction becomes inherent in the text. And it, for example, if a musical is written in a specifically Brechtian style, and it's directed in a Brechtian style, one would say that well, that's inherent in the text, not something, you know, that's not something the director's adding, that's something 
the director is interpreting. And um, so when, to get back to your question, I agree that I don't think anybody's teaching this on, at the collegiate level or, uh, or even at the graduate level, except for a few writing programs I know of. Um, and I think it's often for the very reason you say, I don't think the students really want to hear about it. Um, but they I, need to. But they need to. And I go, around the, I go around the country and I talk to schools and I talk to teachers more than I love to talk to the teachers more than the students because they're going to talk to more students than I am. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing the, pre, the preconceptions that they, or the erroneous notions that they carry in their heads <clears throat> that they're communicating to the next generation of writers and designers and directors. Ralph, I'd like to back up for a second just because I think there may be many people here and, and uh, watching online who know of the Dramatists Guild but don't exactly know what the Dramatists Guild exists to do and what one must do to become a member of the Dramatists Guild. Obviously, it is for writers and composers. But just can you give us the, the really short crazy of, um, of what, it, what it's meant to be? Sure. Uh, the Guild has been around about a hundred years now, and it's a trade association of playwrights and musical theater writers. And basically, it's a group of people who've decided to watch each other's acts and to maintain standards for each other, so that there are standards. And the whole uh, organization is built on one concept, and it's tonight's topic. That's ownership of your property. Copyright is what authors own. And it's, it's the reason they're not unionized uh, writers, like uh, in Hollywood, Writers Guild of America is a labor union, because they do work for hire and the producers own what they write. In the theater, writers don't get paid enough for that. <laughs> I've often said, it, you know, it's one thing to be uh, paid like a, a, a playwright and treated like a playwright, but if you're you know, paid like a screenwriter, I got that backwards. <laughs> Pay like a screenwriter, you better be uh, treated. I completely missed that. <laughs> <laughs> I, just yeah. what you're saying. I think what you're saying is if you're paid by, like a screenwriter, it's okay to be prepared treated. to get treated like, like a rat. screenwriter. <laughs> but if you're paid like a playwright, and paid like, you know, paid like a playwright, paid like a playwright and treated like a screenwriter, it's the worst of all possible. <laughs> so the point yeah, okay. is uh, very catchy. Yeah, it's not for me apparently. Um, the point there is that's the emphasis. That's the issue we make clear to our members, to, to educators, to. It's the only thing the writer has. The other, everybody else in the production has union is unionized labor. The designers are members of the USA. The director is part and the choreographer are members of the STC. There's Local 1, there's 802, there's everybody's a union, and the writer. <laughs> so what the writer has, instead of collective bargaining, instead of health insurance, instead of you know, collectively bargaining terms that increase over time, is they have the ownership of the property they've written. And so they give that up at their peril because it's, it's the only thing they have. And so they, they guard it jealously and appropriately jealously. So let's, let's talk about this idea that, uh, that he sort of brought up, which is he, he feels some sense of pride if his work is copied, or let's use the more current term, sampled, yeah. um, and somehow <laughs> incorporated. Um, is there, and part of this is a question uh, that, that's coming from Twitter, you know, is there a degree to which artists work can be open in the marketplace um, for others to utilize, or is it always due to copyright law something that has to be an absolute? Everything before 1923, you can do what you want to. That's the point of the public domain. Copyright was created as an incentive, as, as a way for artists to earn a living create art that eventually becomes public property. That's why Shakespeare is done. That's why all these things are done. Um, but for the life of the writer, plus 70 years, the writer has 
the discretion to decide how it's played before a play is being done. And designers do. Mm -hmm. oh, let's, I want to open this to everyone. I mean, designers, do you, do you, I mean, you say you're, you're, you know, you like the idea that people might like Well, I wouldn't go that far. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've, had it, I've had it happen to me. You know, one of the first shows I did uh, got remounted and uh, I had taken a photo to create a painted backdrop for it originally. And I walked into the theater of the subsequent production that none of the designers were hired for. And there it was, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I have to say, it, it was really uh, surreal and shocking, and it, and it was, <laughs> made me angry. But at the same time, uh, after I got over that, uh, <laughs> I felt, um, you know, the playwright was still involved. And it was the same director from mm -hmm. the original program. You know, like I said, you know, we must have got got it right. Right, but before yeah. Beth has a fight with you. Yes. I'm having chest pains. <laughs> when you saw them, did you did you go to anyone and say, you're using my work and you haven't asked me or you haven't compensated me? Well, but you, this is this is the gray area. It's because just because that um, one element was very, very similar. Uh, there were other things that were very different, and the whole, uh, it was a different cast, it was a different space, it was a different context, um, it, it was a different production. Uh, and so, for me, that's why I said it's impossible to replicate, because there's all these other factors that go into a production. I find it really hard uh, to segregate, to like pull out one element. Yeah. Uh, and say, that's my ball of twine on that bookshelf. But it's, because it's not, it's part of, it's part of the play. Well, I feel like it's a better use of my time than sweating a ball of twine. And in one production that's done in Florida. It's like, I've got <laughs> other things to think about. I've got three other more productions to design. Um, and it's more exciting and probably more lucrative to me to, just keep designing than to worry about, you know, some hack that's copying my work. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I could go after him or after his producers, but I've got better things to do. Well, when you say you, do you, do you guys have agents? Yeah. yeah. And so you wouldn't, you wouldn't feel comfortable having your agent address that for you? I'm going to have to run their 10% somehow. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's what, that's what they're for. <laughs> now, we're, you know, we're talking about, okay, we're talking about writers, we're talking about design, we're, you know, in this issue about you can't own, you can't own the idea, only the expression of the idea. Um, and, and the idea in that things are created collaboratively right. all the time. Um, I'm wondering if, if Bev and Ralph can speak to the issue of what is a director's ownership right? Because a director can have a great deal of input as to what ends up on that stage, what the words are, what it looks like, and so on. I'd love to close the loop on this just for two seconds, and then we'll switch to directors, sure. which is to say, um, sure, you can sample anything you like, including an image used on the backdrop. Here's the response to that. Ask. If the director had sent an email saying, hey, everything else is gonna be different, I'm really sorry we couldn't get you hired on the job, we're gonna do all sorts of other stuff with the set, but I really, really, really love that image and I'd like to use it, would that be okay with you? Again, because most artists are pretty accommodating and you probably like this director and wanna work with them again, you probably would have written back and said, yeah, and if somewhere in the program you could kind of give me some acknowledgement on the staff page of saying, you know, image by me, that would be really lovely. But of course, go ahead and use it. And then that awful moment of standing there and going, that's mine, I'm pissed. And having to cycle through that and be like, but this is a friend and everything else is different and the cast is different and it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. You're like, could have been solved in a really fast two email exchange where you would have felt, Acknowledged, respected, and and how much how much time would it have taken to write that email? Nothing. 
how much time did it take for you to eat your feelings? Well, you don't look like you eat your feelings. <laughs> Yeah, I guess the longer I would have taken my email. Be, be, before you jump to my other question, there's a question that came in from Twitter, and I just want to ask you, going going back to the ball of twine or the bed of anything, would you feel differently if you saw it used used in something that you suspected there was more money involved in? Oh yeah. <laughs> it also depends on the, the well, if there's more money involved. The contract should have been written by But um, it's, a, it's also there's a scale of it. You know, when you're talking about a photograph that's the entire backdrop, that's one thing. But if you're also talking about your contribution to the original production, in which I'm a lighting designer, so I feel strongly that at the end of each scene, it should have ended with a zero second blackout. Boom, 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 boom. And like that was just the way it went. And then the director goes off and directs it with an entirely different production, cast, set design, it's actually in the rounds, and it's all different, but goes to the light designer and says, you know, it worked really well that all the scenes ended in a zero second blackout. I mean, is that... And, and these gentlemen were paid to mm -hmm. have that idea. You were paid to have that idea. And you it gave it to the production. Mm -hmm. And that's what directors do, that's what designers do. They're paid to have ideas and about how to turn a written work into a live experience. But then when it's turned back into a written work that's published for broader usage, if the end of every scene is written, immediate blackout. Mm -hmm. That's not something they can own. That's right. right. So. And wasn't it, didn't Samuel French used to print the ground plans, like yes. in the back of every yeah. script, where the doors were, where the furniture was, yeah. the props, all of that. So, you know, that goes back to your earlier statement about, well, who owns that now? I mean, it's... Well, and I, I think that there are people here from the organization who can speak more intelligently than I can, but having sort of agented through the journey of that, because early in my career, you got the props list and what color dress everybody wore, and then people sort of had that dawning awareness of like, oh, let us give you a blueprint to use all of the designer's work, because there could even be a production photo in addition to the blueprint. And all of that started to come out, and people were at least theoretically encouraged to go do their own work. L looping to the now, let's go to the director. The director um, and I'm curious for Ralph to speak to this because I know this is a big issue for the dramatist guild. I have an incredibly simple view on this topic, and maybe it's influenced by the fact that the bulk of my work is done with writers. But there is a reason why an author's contract says. Nobody can change their work without their permission, and all such changes shall be owned by them, free of any means and encumbrances. I don't care who gives you an idea, who gives you a great joke, who gives you a way to structure your show. I don't care if it's the director, the producer, the lighting designer, a stagehand, the person who picks the playbills up off the floor. It is yours. And no one should be coming after you with their hand out saying, you know, you wrote that fight because I told you you should have a fight there, or that character tells that joke because I told you that joke in a bar one night. I mean, if I came after writers for money every time they borrowed my name, <laughs> stupid things I'm prone to say, <laughs> um, characteristics of what it means to work in an office, because players are like, I've never worked in an office, so I used you as the character. Uh. You know, like, there, there's sort of a side to being friends with writers, you will show up in their work. I, I once, Just uh, accept it. I once had a playwright and director discussing a costume design suddenly go, he'd be dressed like Howard. <laughs> and apparently they both knew what that meant. <laughs> but, but so so you're speaking specifically about the director making suggestions. I guess we should mention that this might extend to dramaturgs. There was certainly a famous case over rent where Granted, after Jonathan had passed away, a dramaturg made claims that they were an author of the piece. And I too would make the distinction, and this happened with a client who was working with a dramaturg, and we had the deal all worked out, and there was a moment one day sitting at the computer where the dramaturg said to him, oh, she should just say something like this. And she kind of kicked his butt off the stool and sat down and she started writing scenes. And he was perfectly fine with that, and that led to kind of the production draft of the script. And I would say, 
that was the moment when they finally told me about it that I said, well, now we need to have a different conversation because sitting in your living room and saying, what about this? And sitting down and typing six pages of dialogue are two different relationships. Mm -hmm. But no, if you're the literary manager at the theater or you've been hired as a production dramaturg on something, um, there, again, there's a reason why that language exists in writer's contracts. And I'm sorry, this is a huge thing for me, but everybody comes to writers with their hands out. And you know what? I'm one of those everybody's. And it really, when I watch it pile up and pile up and those slices of the pie get taken away and taken away, and I see the checks with all the deductions for everybody, and I just think, why do you get up in the morning and write? We have to give people reasons to get up and write, or with the exception of the writers in this room, none of us would have jobs. We would all be unemployed if people were not writing plays and musicals or devising work or otherwise creating work that we could negotiate, design, publish. It has to start there. It has to be protected. We call ourselves job creators. <laughs> and, and it's absolutely true. You see, you know, when, when the writer starts, they have 100% of the work. And then, the, you know, uh, uh, equity workshop and they get 5% and a developmental theater and they get 5% and a director and they get 5% then the producer takes 40% and so and then all the agents take their commissions and the lawyers take their cuts and the New York producer and takes you know, the, the institutional not-for-profit that started it in New York takes right, 10 right. before the commercial producer takes 40 right so uh, but at that point you've written somebody else's play you have nothing, you know. The, the point of the, that revenue stream is it's supposed to keep writers uh, writing for the theater instead of looking for jobs elsewhere. So we've had this conversation with a lot of institutional theaters recently, and a lot of them have come around to the idea that <clears throat> if they're taking, if they're sort of taxing the authors that they are getting nonprofit status to produce, they're sort of defeating the purpose for which they were served. And they're also taking money from the, what, is, what is basically paperclip money for an institution is grocery money. Right, okay, but we've moved, we've moved off the issue of rights. The, the issue of, of compensation for artists right. is, is, so I do want to come back to this question and I will ask you, Ralph, what, designers have rights, yeah. authors have rights, right. um, what rights does a director have in a show if they, let's start with it, a show where they have directed the world premiere? They have exactly the rights that their contract says they have, vis-a-vis -vis the producer they signed it with. If they've also signed a, an agreement with the direct, with the author, then they have those additional rights. But if you're just talking about copyright law, both the Copyright Office and the Department mm -hmm. of Justice have said, Stage directions are not copyrightable. Um, we've had this fight. There's been lawsuits. I was involved in the Red case. I, I co-authored the amicus brief that the Drama Guild submitted on that case, and <clears throat> that was a dramaturg situation. But it's a similar situation. Um, there's been direct, uh, directors in Chicago doing *You're in Town*, mm -hmm. and uh, we've dealt. So we've dealt with this over the years, uh, and. It's, it's frustrating because they, they keep insisting that they have a right that doesn't exist. And it's hard to talk them out off of this. Um, there are some academics who have a, a legal theory by which they might have it. Um, but come law at this point in time says no. There's no property interest, at least no copyright property interest in stage direction. There might be some other, there might be a trademark issue, but that's a legal issue that we don't need to get into. I mean, the tricky thing with copyright and what we've been hearing for since the mid-90s is that like anything created artistic, whether it's music or a play or a movie, um, is under copyright law. And so it's, yeah, I now feel that it's, there's a mindset out there that you are not an artist unless you create something that's copyrightable. Mm -hmm. And there's no way to make a living as an artist unless you have copyright ownership of something. There, there's, there are interpretive artists and there are creative artists. 
You can be an artist. An actor is an artist. They're not creating anything but their performance. Uh, they don't own their performance. Um, you know, those are ideas. Ideas are not ownable. Uh, the, the script is the specific physical expression of that idea, and so becomes property. Uh, and that property is governed by federal law. Um, so this notion that because you're an artist, you have therefore created something, and because you created something, you're an artist and deserve to own it, is circular and doesn't lead to anything except a misunderstanding of, of the law. I think you smiled and pointed well, on Well, because he was trying to leap in, so okay. trying to leave space for to leap in. It wasn't, it's, it's not an argument about law, it's an argument about uh, just um, public mindset, <clears throat> you know, which is, um, what I don't understand legally, and maybe you can explain to me, is that I do know that choreography is it's copyrightable, and staging, different from stage direction, stage direction being written in the column of a, um, of a script, but staging seems like it would be copyrightable, especially if you're talking about the staging that Robert Wilson does, that seems indistinguishable from choreography, or if you're talking about fight choreography that actually has the word choreography in the building. The choreography is copyrightable because the copyright law specifically identifies it as a copyrightable subject. Direction is not identified in copyright. There are a list of things that are deemed copyrightable. Choreography is one of them. You can notate choreography, you can perform choreography independent of the show. I remember when the, the musical The Red Shoes was done, only ran a week, but uh, <laughs> but the ballet the, that was choreographed for that show is still performed, um, and the choreographer has every, every right to continue to receive license and royalties for that. Staging is not copyrightable because it's not fixed in any tangible medium, which is required for copyright law, and it is a set of ideas. The idea that Wilson has, you know, if he has an idea for the way it looks. Those elements, you guys own. He doesn't own. He had the idea for them, but unless he designed those elements himself, I'm not aware of how he worked. But if, if he designed them, then he owns them. If he didn't design them, then you own them. When, when a director says, <clears throat> I have an idea for, for this play. I want a dollhouse at the foot of the stage. Um, he doesn't build the dollhouse. He doesn't design the dollhouse. These guys do that, and they light the dollhouse, and they make it. So he's claiming ownership of not just the author's right to say, that's a good idea, I'll keep it in the play. He's also taking their rights as well. <clears throat> How did he become uh, the, the keeper of, of all things in this production? So let me ask a, a somewhat different question, because there, there are some people commenting, and I don't think we're, <coughs> I don't think we have the right group of people necessarily to debate the, the specific nature of copyright law and whether it's good or bad <laughs> as it stands. Because I think um, I certainly know the position of some of the panelists already. But what I'd like to talk about is um, the dividing line between referencing other works of art utilizing small portions of it under fair use or tipping over into utilizing copyrighted work. Um, we don't have to stick with the specific example, but certainly the play Mr. Burns um, is, makes extensive reference to um, a, not just The Simpsons, but a specific episode of The Simpsons. Now, it doesn't enact it, it repeats some lines from it, but it, it, especially in the first act, deals a great deal of what's happened in that. How would someone know, in designs, you can see designs that do incorporate images uh, that we made. Can I use the example of red? Okay. Because I feel like it, it, it touches on a bunch of these issues. Uh, one, it's a new play that was done 
in New York and then all the over the country. Everything. And uh, it's one location and it's a very specific location and a lot of the designs look very, very similar. Uh, and you're, you have to create paintings done by Rocco, which um, are impossible to recreate. <laughs> but uh, Especially in the time given on stage. <laughs> but, but there was an issue about copyright initially with how much of those pieces of artwork could be represented on stage. And I don't remember how it all played out, but uh, to varying degrees, uh, I know we both worked on the production. <laughs> I, mean, I remember the production manager of the production I worked on explaining to me only there was a percentage, only like 30% of any given painting could be seen at any given time, so they all had to be stacked and masked. And at the end of the production, it's I'm told the contract specified that the, all the paintings had to be burned or destroyed, and a video of the burning photographs had to be sent to the That would be a great YouTube channel. <laughs> 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 So, you know, and then it also goes back to what we were talking about earlier, is that there was some wonderful set of research photos, photos of Rocco's studio, which every set designer and lighting designer found, and so then all the sets looked alike, um, to a certain degree, based on whether you were in a thrust stage or a proscenium or a big house or a small house. But no, we couldn't point fingers at each other and say, um, <coughs> What's the difference said, between homage and stealing? Well, yeah. not even homage. As I said before, there are some elements of the play that are inherent in the text. The staging comes from the text. Yeah. Anybody reading that text is going to stage it the same way. And you have to have Rothko's studio. It's got to look like an art studio. It's got to have those kind of paintings in it. How different can you make it? So that's called scenes off there, general scenes that are not copyrightable because they're, they're inherent to that story. That any boy meets girl, boy loses girl, boy gets girl, scenes are fair. You can't own that. You can own Romeo and Juliet, but you can't own you know, generic kind of notions, even if they're written down or designed. So, I mean, there are designs that are very specific and very unique, and, and they, they rise to the level of an ownership interest. And then there are those that are not. But then back to, to my question about, say, Mr. Burns. There are certainly other plays that mm -hmm. reference earlier plays yeah. or other works of fiction. Everything is based on something. Every, mm -hmm. every, every artist is drawing on their life to write what they're writing. The world is their inspiration. Everything <laughs> is. Some of those things are copyrightable. Some of them are not. Some of them are people they know, and some of them are made up. But they've chosen, that process of choosing what is and what is not in your play is a fundamental part of authorship. The craft of writing it is part two. But so, if those elements are drawn from another work? If the idea is drawn from another work, then it's, it's uh, up to us. See, there's an inherent tension in the culture between those who own property and those who want to use it. Um, so, <laughs> how do you reconcile, how do you reconcile that conflict? The copyright laws is one of the ways we reconcile the conflict. The reason copyright law works is because it has a safety valve for the public. That's called fair use. And fair use is an exception to copyright law. And it says, okay, you're in, I infringe, but I had a good reason. And some of the good reasons include um, parody. Parody is a, is, is a form of social commentary. Uh, so, for example, if you write a play about the uh, sitcom Three's Company, uh, you, have fun, you have the perfect legal right to make fun of Three's Company. What you can't do is satire. The difference is, and there is a difference, um, Parody makes fun of the thing itself. Satire uses the thing to make fun of something else or comment on some other thing. 
Um, as long as the Three's Company play is commenting on the characters in Three's Company and the ideas inherent in Three's Company, including the sexual mores of it and the roles of that, um, then it's parody. If he uses it to talk about, you know, uh, a wide host of social issues unrelated, then, then it's satire. And that becomes a factual question for a court. But if by that time, you're already in court. So, you know, and that's not where you want to be. So fair use is one of the ways that people, that you resolve the tension between the owner and the users um, so that everybody's interests are protected because things can be based on other things and they should be. Art grows organically on, on what came before it. So you have, but you have to respect the rights of ownership. Of if you're using enough of that material that your material couldn't work without it and you're just trading on it, like there was a, a book about the O.J. Simpson trial um, that was written in the form of Cat in the Hat. And, um, <laughs> and Ted Geisel didn't like that. And so Dr. Seuss sued the author and it was found to be satire, therefore an infringement of copyright. Because it was using the Cat in the Hat as a vehicle to tell some other unrelated thing. And they don't have a right to the popularity, the, not the not notoriety, and the success that Ted Geisel created out of Cat in the Hat. They're just using it without compensation. So there's a difference. Uh, question from Twitter. There's an artist who is not yet represented, is not yet a member of the Guild or United Scenic Artists, speaking to the group here. Um, what is the best way for them to assert their rights and to protect their copyright if they do not have representation? They have the same rights with or without representation. Um, the Copyright Office is online and it costs $35 to register your play or music. So, or designs, I suppose. Um, so it's, it shouldn't be a great hurdle to anyone who wants to do that. Minimum, there's plenty of information out there. There are books. I mean, the internet is a, is a tool uh, that writers now can use. It's funny, it's a double-edged sword. It allows greater access to material for infringement. <laughs> but it also allows people to find out about the infringement. <laughs> So, um, and we just had that experience in Texas. So, um, that, uh, that right that you have, look, you have a copyright the day you wrote it down. That's when you have the copyright. But you can't defend the copyright unless, or any of your rights, unless you register the copyright with the copyright office. There's no alternative to that. Um, we've passed over something. Uh, it's come up a couple of times. Uh, we were talking you brought up the example when you talked about a play based on Three's Company uh, for the distinction between satire versus parody. Um, people have asked point blank, um, who is in the right regarding David Ackman's play, David Ackman's play 3C? Is that a work that is permissible or is that a work which um, cannot be done without the approval of the copyright? That's a case in progress and I won't comment on Still in progress, okay. Um, Bet. Uh, one of your playwright clients comes to you, has a finished play, and uh, perhaps there is some material that um, either reminds you of another piece of work or directly references another piece of work. What do you do? I'm sorry, now I do sound like we're in a game. What do you do? What do I do? Well, first of all, I complain that they didn't involve me in the process earlier. <laughs> But, but fortunately, my clients are really well behaved and or I'm a busy body, so I tend to like, know about things in, in sort of concept phase and then be involved throughout the process. But we certainly have gotten to the point occasionally of even being in rehearsals and they've said, oh, that little ditty that you uh, hear in the play, that's actually you know, some obscure Japanese anime TV show from the 60s. Um, I neglected to tell you that and I say, well, You've signed your author agreement, and it said that the play was wholly original to you, and so we have now lied. 
and you usually get on the phone with the theater and you discuss what your options are and your options may be to go scramble and get the rights to the poem or the TV show song or whatever it might be um, or it might be to say let's quickly hire some cool young composer lyricist and have them write something that we can record for less money or at least faster than I'm gonna go find some Japanese TV show producer from the 60s and get them to write something you know, in the style of. Now, if we're just gonna talk about the truth of what happens in the real world, the truth of what happens in the real world is Maybe stuff like that gets used all the time. I myself have worked on projects where they have sampled songs in the sound design or whatever and people have turned a blind eye to it and I've worked on things where on occasion they've gotten letters saying you thought you could use that Academy Award winning song? We don't think so. Yeah. Or you can't write a check. Um, but by and large I try to know that that's happening. I try to be clear whether it's something that's under copyright because Ralph is right. Artists are inspired by things. Writers are inspired by things. You see a play and it has a premise and you disagree with it and you spend the next five years writing a play refuting that premise. Or one of my favorite stories of this in, in my own professional life is uh, Aaron Posner was seeing a production of The Seagull that he thought was truly, truly terrible. And as he was leaving, the storming out of the theater at the end of it, he said, you know, that was terrible. I'm going to write a version of the seagull and I'm going to call it Stupid Fucking Bird. <laughs> and he wrote a play and it's getting done all over the place. And Hal Round has probably now beeped me. Um, I apologize, Polly Carl. Uh, you know, happily, that's a situation where it was in the public domain and we didn't have to deal with it. But sure, I don't have to go after the rights to, to films all the time. And you do spend a certain amount of time educating to say, well, you're writing about something, you know, events that really happened, but you're really just using facts that have appeared in 150 articles, so we're fine. Or you're using a journalist book that they spent 10 years researching and accessing that family's archives and reading unpublished journals. And so clearly these are not just facts that are in the public domain, and we need to go get the rights to that journalist book. Now, I've been giving favor to people who've been tweeting. Uh, I should, and forgive me because I'm watching them, so I've also not been looking over here, but are, are there people here who have questions and I ask you to keep them focused and brief? Yes, in the back. So, so one, of my, one of my issues in general with like copyright is that I feel like it's like incredibly archaic. Like the like idea of copyright was created before like new expression of movements were, uh, like, was shown to the world and then like we, we created the internet and like sort of like an extension of that, like technological. And I think like the way artists work now is that there's a lot more com conversations with like, like, okay, so the public domain was made because like after 100 years something became big. But now something that was made two years ago or 10 years ago, like The Simpsons, is ubiquitous to all of us immediately when we have the internet to show us all that it wants. And I, I, I just, I, don't, I wonder like how can we as writers like, like how, how can we like challenge the law to like reflect the society we live in now? And this might be a better question for like the new media day later, but I think it like, well, just brought a lot of the things. To, to restate it quickly, because the microphone's pointing this way for those at home, just as uh, the question is that, um, Copyright law is something that was created many years ago. Uh, we have a lot of things that exist in the culture that people want to respond to and comment on. And is copyright law in its current form archaic? I mean, the First Amendment was written a long time ago, too. <laughs> <laughs> they're still relevant. I mean, um, you know, copyright law is a way of organizing the society. The society wants to be disorganized. That's a public discussion to have, and they have that debate. It's called copy left, um, and so there's a debate. There's a, a serious intellectual conversation that's going on, not in Congress because they don't have those kind of conversations, <laughs> but, but in the culture at large uh, about you know what what is the appropriate duration of copyright, or what it, what should it include, what shouldn't it include. Um, you know, I represent copyright owners, but they're also copyright users. When you make a musical, nine times out of ten, you're writing a musical based on some underlying work. And now, very often, it's a movie or something. 
that's still under copyright. So uh, when, when a, a movie studio goes to Congress and lobbies for 20 more years of copyright, that's not necessarily in your interest as playwrights and musical theater writers. Mm -hmm. They are diminishing the public domain by keeping things out of it that used to be in, going into it. And there was a professor, Lessig, from California who sort of leads, leads this movement um, about, well, you know, maybe copyright should be five years, and then you can renew it every five years, up to a certain number. Um, but you have the responsibility of continuing to use it, and if you're not using it, then it becomes public domain. I mean, there's a lot of ways to address this issue, but ultimately it's a legislative issue, and about your putting pressure on your Congress to, to make those kind of changes. Um, let me take one forward here, yes. I'm writing in a musical that's not based on anything. Mazel tov. <laughs> 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 really is, is it called Seinfeld? Yeah. 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 So, uh, I started in 2011 after a year being in my own mind, working with the composer, and as he's generating music ideas and musical themes, we're going back and forth about the construction of the world, the characters that they live in, and what has influenced them that might be in literature or theater. So now that we're to this point, the lyricist has stepped in in February and has decided, OK, you have a decent book. I'll get in bed with you guys. Um, so we moved over, and she got in bed. Now, um, we know she owns the lyrics, because at this point, she's writing lyrics to the story that we've formed. Over the two years of collaboration with the composer, does my composer own any of my work, or as I pinned it, it's my book, and the music he's been coming up with is his, even though I say, this would be a great place for a ballad, I don't own that ballad. He owns it because he wrote it. Okay, let me just restate it quickly. Um, the question is, gentleman's been working as a book writer with a composer over a period of time uh, to develop a musical. A lyricist has joined them. Yes. Um, but to what degree in the collaboration, because the book writer and the composer in particular have collaboratively created the shape of the work, does the composer have any ownership of the book writer's portion, or do they together ultimately inform any portion of, of what the lyricist is writing and have any ownership there? Do you have a collaboration agreement? No. Then you all own all of it. You own the lyrics. She owns the book. He owns both the book and lyrics. Well, you have what is called a we joint a non disclosure agreement. It doesn't matter. It says we each own our own property. But you don't know what the property is yet. Yeah. Um, so a collaboration agreement is essentially a contract that gets you out of copyright law. You know, copyright law is going to govern until, until you have a contract that says otherwise. And right now, if you are writing without a collaboration agreement, it could be deemed a joint work. And a joint work is a work where all the authors own all the material, and they split it evenly, despite despite whatever contributions you may have made, as little or as much as contribution you may have made. Uh, it's also you can each license a non-exclusive right to the work, which makes the value of it that much less. So, now, what if I write the screenplay and the kids' books and stuff like that well, without them? Um, I don't think we can go deep into the specifics of this. This sounds like something you need specific counsel on. Yeah. Uh, but, I'll, but I'll say succinctly, it can be whatever the three of you agree exactly. to be. Okay. Just make sure so it's, it's in writing. writing. Right. So if your collaborators say to you, I don't write movies and I don't write children's books, and originally it was your story and your characters, so you know what? You go do that. You need a piece of paper that says, I can adapt this in any other form and do anything with it that I want. And you don't get billing, you don't get money, you don't have any ownership of that. You can decide that you're going to give them all of your money and make none of it. You just have to have a piece of paper that says that. And, and, the and, guild, and you're stupid. <laughs> <laughs> and the Guild has a collaboration agreement to give our members that does exactly this. So if you're a member, you can use it. Let me, let me toss in um, a question, another question that's come from here, and then I'll come back. To the group here. Um, can we talk briefly about whether playwrights, designers, um, can enter into contracts that are work for hire, in which they ultimately do not end up owning their work? Does that situation exist 
in the theater that's yeah, been specific. Of I've, I've actually seen those contracts. And before I knew any better, I've signed those contracts. <laughs> <laughs> but you shouldn't. And there's, I found situations um, when I have a specific relationship, especially with a choreographer. Because the choreography, in the, in the dance world work that I've done, it tends to be different because the choreography is created and it is forever attached to that piece of music and often forever attached to that lighting design. Mm -hmm. And there are lighting designers and choreographers that are still traveling the world mounting Jerome Robbins' choreography with Tom Skelton's lighting mm -hmm. um, decades after the fact. Um, so I will sign, you know, I have licensed my lighting design to choreographers in perpetuity, perpetuity. <laughs> I wrote it. It's, easy, it's easier to write. Than this. <laughs> um, and because of my relationship with the choreographer, I thought that was just, and or the size of the fee, it was an appropriate thing to do. And that's much, I somehow feel more comfortable doing that than mm. doing work for hire. Although, lest my chest explode, <laughs> you also can do a license for several years that can then be subsequently renewed so that you are being paid each time that renewal happens. If it has gone on to become incredibly successful, maybe your rates need to go up. So you, you can honor that idea that, that your lighting and that piece of choreography may go on to live for decades together without down the road saying, well, I didn't know it was going to get performed at the Met for $35 a performance. <laughs> uh, work for hire is a legal concept, and it comes out of the copyright law. And there is not everything is eligible to be work for hire. You either have to be a full-time em employee, not just an independent contractor, but an employee, doing work within the scope of your employment, or, and then, then it's work for hire, or you're an independent contractor, and you've agreed to do work for hire, you've signed an agreement that says it's work for hire, and it fits within certain categories that the copyright law enumerates. And it does, the copyright law does not enumerate plays as work for hire. So we've had this discussion with certain movie studios um, who like to come to Broadway and produce shows and think they're going to do it on a Hollywood basis, and we've explained to them that no, that, that's not the way theater works. You were very careful to say plays. Is there a distinction for musicals in any way? No. Okay, just curious. Okay, some more questions from out here. Yes. Um, what about uh, English translations of works which are written uh, in foreign countries and therefore under completely different copyright law? Okay, the question is about English translations of works that are foreign language works uh, and maybe under different copyright law. It, it's the same thing. If you want to adapt something into English, you need to make a deal with whoever the copyright holder is or whoever their representative is. That could be the SACD in Paris, and that may be an agent, that may be the original writer themselves. Um, and the terms will be very similar to what you would negotiate if you had written a play and you were licensing it to someone. You would specify what territory, what languages, is it English language throughout the world, is it English language in North America, in the United States, do you have the rights for three years, if you get it produced for a certain number of performances, do your rights expand? Um, but in the same way that uh, if a Terence McNally play is being translated into German for the German market, it's absolutely the same thing if you're trying to do something for a play here. But we should say, as a, as a twist on this, um, translations of foreign works which are in the public domain, each individual translation can be copyrighted by the author of the translation. That's right. Yeah, every Chekhov translation that you would consider for a production, unless it was written quite some time ago, is all under copyright. Paul Schmidt's adaptation is under copyright. Okay, yes. <laughs> In sending out a script to a producer or a theater, I had it copyrighted. And subsequently, six months later or two weeks later, I keep rewriting. Do I need to recopyright every time I have rewritten the script? The, the question is, if a script is written and then there are subsequent revisions to the script, does it need to be uh, recopyrighted? 
my feeling is there's sort of three points in the life of a play mm -hmm. where you may want to re, uh, register the copyright. When your play is done enough that you, that you or think, uh, complete enough uh, that you feel comfortable sending it out into the world, it should have its you know blushes and raincoat on it. It should have its protection. Mm -hmm. um, subsequently, if it ever gets produced or you do enough rewrites. It may, you may create additional copyrightable material, uh, a new character, a new song, a new scene. Um, at some point, and usually this happens in the production process, you usually wait to the production process, because that process itself, generally, uh, at least the, the original production, is going to generate a lot of rewrites. Um, that's the nature of the business. So you generally want to copyright you know, the production version. Um, and then when it's, if it's published, you're, that, that's going to get, you know, that final version should be the copyrighted version. So there's probably three points. If you're, you don't have to register every new draft of everything you do, that's not necessary. If, if they could lift the material out and create something new with it, then you probably should register a renewal for a revised copyright. But um, most things are editing and switching around and new language not necessarily enough material on the whole to warrant re-registration. Another question from out here. Oh gosh, so many. <laughs> yes. uh, something that I saw in the copyright form when I do it online is where you can exclude material from copyright. Uh, this question is about uh, something on the copyright form about excluding yeah, material. Well, I don't do a copyright anymore. There's a field here where they ask, what would you like to from the copyright. Yeah. The copyright form says, uh, you know, what are you registering for copyright? Mm -hmm. There, you may be submitting a screen, uh, uh, a musical. You only wrote the lyrics. So you're going to register the lyrics. And you're going to exclude the music and the book from your registration. Um, so you only have a right to register your work. But under the copyright, also this is a key point, there's a a line where you ask you, if, if, is this a derivative work? 6A, I think, on the floor. Um, yeah. This means you have the right from the original author to create a new version of that work. Um, a movie, you know, a, a, a musical is derivative work based on the movie. The movie is actually derivative work based on the screenplay. Um, so when you create a new version of that thing, it's a derivative, that's one of the copyrights a copyright owner has, the right to license derivative works. So when you register your work, it's going to ask you, is this a derivative work? Well, if it's based on underlying material, you, you have to have, and you're redoing that material, it's like a new version of that song, or then you have to say yes, and you have to have the approval of the copyright owner to register it. Otherwise, you're creating a fraudulent document. Is this set design a derivative work of a play? N not necessarily. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, only, it's independently copyrightable, but... Because conceivably, other plays can be performed on that set. Right. Um, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, but I play one on campus. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 the derivative work of the play is another version of the play. Uh, your design is, you might be able to take parts of your design and license a catalog of uh, an art, book of art, right. a design art. That book is a derivative work based on your design. Um, you would have, they can't do that without your permission, and they should pay you for that. Um, when they do the program book within the lobby, mm -hmm. there, there are photographs of your work in the program, in the souvenir in the program. If you're not getting paid for that, You've got a bad agent. That sounds like your Jeff Foxworthy version. <laughs> you know you've got that. You've got. Um, well, this comes back to an issue with the directors, which is um, why a director's work isn't copyrightable because it is entirely contingent upon the script, which they don't own. Yeah. Uh, an evening of stage directions is called, you know, wandering aimlessly. <laughs> there's, there's, so um, well, there is an exception to this, which is that great group, the neo-futurists, has done two evenings yeah. of the.
neglected stage directions of Yuji Nami. And I would argue they're not wandering aimlessly. I very intentionally had them cross stage right. They're just wandering without any text. <laughs> so a couple more questions here. Yes. Um, can we talk a little bit about how rights are for creators and the buyers? Like if they have any rights, um, okay. if people want to that. The question is about the rights for creators of devised work, by which you mean a company devised work, and what the ownership of that is. The rights are the same, it's just how you split it up. I mean, and that should, that should be in a contract, otherwise you're all joint authors. But let's unpack that a little bit, because I spend a lot of time usually belatedly advising people about this, and you know, it, it, we sent people out to interview people, and now we're creating a show from it, and we want you to be the agent for that. And I say, okay, did you get all those people to sign things? Yes, we can use anything they said on stage. Mm -hmm. Great, do you have permission to publish what they said? Oh, uh, do you know how to find those people? Well, it was people we stopped on the street, so no. You know, you have the ability to record what they said. So it, it is one of those moments where it's very good to get some advice, it's very good to get some sample agreements, and there are now enough companies out there between Tectonic and civilians and places like that to get some advice to really say, the people you're interviewing you need to address, the people who are doing the interviews you need to address. Mm -hmm. If those people are then actors in the workshop, mm -hmm. but six of the eight of them go on to the production, but two of them get other work, how are you addressing that? Um, and I have spent some serious time with a calculator doing the, if you did the workshop but not the production, you get this. If you did the production but not the transfer, you get this. Because ultimately we're trying to behave honorably. Um, again, if you're the production dramaturg on that, but the director turns to you at some point and says, oh, we spent the day improv and you took notes all day, um, go, go home and write some scenes based on the improvs. Who owns that? Again, the answer is, what does the paperwork say? Um, but, but certainly every time somebody starts putting words on paper, if you don't have some stake in that show, whether you're an actor, the dramaturg, the director, the playwright, the producer, the house manager, you need to stop and say, look, I was hired to be house manager, but I went home last night and I wrote 16 pages of text. I'm not just the house manager anymore. Um, Howard, I would also like to invite everyone to attend tomorrow night's panel because there will be discussion about the wise work of tomorrow night. Uh, tomorrow night, uh, both here, uh, is it here again tomorrow night? Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. Tomorrow night at the Lark, and of course online at HowlRound TV, uh, the discussion will include more about the nature of devised work. Right. So there's your commercial. Um, <laughs> question for me. Um, after this evening, I found the interplay between the four of you so interesting that I've decided to produce a work based on it. And I go to a playwright, <laughs> and I tell the playwright about unique character dynamics. Um, and it's in no way a transcription, but it's the idea. But the idea is mine. I bring them the story. I bring them the character out of all. And we invent some people who aren't really part of it. We disguise you so completely no one would know. Um, do I, as the producer, for having conceived that idea, have any rights to uh, that finished work? It depends how detailed the idea is. Again, the idea is not ownable. The idea of doing a play about four people sitting in a room being uh, into, on a panel is not uh, original. It's not, <laughs> it's not copyrighted. So, so the producer, look, every producer, the reason the producer produces something is because they had an idea. They thought their idea might be, this is a great play, I should produce it. Or their idea may, may be, I need to go out and acquire certain rights because I think that would make a great musical and I'll hire this person and that person. And they may have input all during the process, but that's what being a producer means. It doesn't certainly make you an author. Um, but if you wrote text that specifically describes characters that are not generic, that are very specific, and, and 
create a narrative that is very specific, and then you hire a writer to adapt it into the form of a, of a play, there's a, there's a legitimate uh, issue there as to who owns what, and it could be argued you're a joint author and group. Bet and threw your head back yeah. in <laughs> angst. Please share it. I'll say publicly, I, I've made some bad choices <laughs> in this world, and if I knew then what I knew now, Producers like to do this a lot. They call you and they say, I have this idea. Four people from different walks of life sit on a panel and talk about rights. I want to hire your client to write it. I get 20% because it's my idea. And most of the time they're not going after major writers because that's why they think they'll get their 20%. And most writers want the little bit of money that they're going to get paid. And it already has a producer, so it's going to get produced. And so even though I say to them, 20% seems an awful lot for two sentences, no characters, no plot, no reason for conflict, not even particularly interesting characters. Um, <laughs> why are you giving this person 20%? They invariably take the deal. Now the thing that I've learned after 17 years of being an agent, the worst deals never wind up with shows that get produced. There is something about that that it never happens. But I have made deals where we've given away big percentages for a concept that was barely more than two sentences. And I'll say here, and if my clients are watching this, they can call me tomorrow. I regret it. It was the wrong thing to do. I've, I've seen first, broad, I see all the Broadway contracts that come through because um, I have to sign them. So I have to look at them and, and talk to the producers sometimes. And I actually had a Broadway producer about, this is a big show that ran, so I'm not going to get into that. But the, uh, he said, it was my idea, don't I get something as for having conceived this? What was your idea? Your idea was to license a TV show and turn it into a musical. <laughs> a TV show that has already been existing in, in the other forms, movies, cartoons, uh, 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 toys. That was your idea, to turn it into a musical? No, that's, that's called producing. That's called producing. <laughs> and that, and he eventually understood that. But I've also had other play producers say, no, you know, I've been working with this playwright for two years on a, on a story that I conceived originally, and I've written characters, and I've written a, an outline before I got this guy involved. And, you know, then there's a discussion between them about their relationship. But nine times out of ten, it's not like that at all. It's, it's as Beth described. It's about producers thinking because they had an idea to do a show, they for, therefore should own the show. And, you know, that's what Hollywood is for. Now, now before you all jump with your hands, there is, if there's such a thing as emphatic tweeting, I have one question. <laughs> <laughs> and people are retweeting and favoriting and liking. So I need to ask this, and I'm going to read it directly. Um, anonymous asks, <laughs> if I'm writing theater that will be produced only in not nonprofits, never commercial, what's the relevance of rights? That's the question. The relevance of what? Rights. It's exactly the same. <laughs> nonprofits have to pay royalties. Nonprofits. Look, the theater in Texas that just tried to rewrite um, Hands on a Hard Box um, had a license to do it. They were a nonprofit theater. If you don't have the rights to stop them, then they make their own show out of your show. That's the relevance of rights. And most shows are produced commercially. So right. Lynn Nottage wrote Ruined, which has only right. been produced at not-for-profits, but she shouldn't hold the copyright to her play or make any money off of it. It feels to me like somebody doesn't understand the vocabulary they're yeah. using. So it may be a, a deeper question that we should be unpacking, and if you're out there listening and tweeting, rephrase the question and we'll try again. Okay, Howard, I'm so sorry, but we have a really like rabid question in the front row, and I'm worried if we don't answer it. Can we? Can I throw the ball of energy to somebody? I think we need, to, we, we, we need to, we should go to some people who haven't had a chance to ask the question yet. I'm sorry, I, I do wanna move on. Yes, you've been waiting in the back.
have been transcribed and submitted to the wire services, many of them failure. Uh, it does come on, it, it could be under fair use. Because I also because his words are so distinctive that at least he's a scholar of people from that generation recognize themselves that world. But you're asking whether, uh, I'll repeat the question, yes. but just to clarify, are you asking if the actual broadcast itself is being used? Of the okay, broadcast. so the question is, there's a play set post-World War II which would utilize a broadcast by Edward R. Murrow, which at some point was transcribed and was distributed. Um, is that available for use, or is that something for which rights would need to be acquired? The same as if it was in a newspaper. I mean, the, the facts that, of, that Murrow were reporting on, uh, you could talk about, but the text of his, look, you can't copyright a speech unless you then publish the speech. Um, you know, oral, it has to be fixed in a tangible medium. So Murrow said these things out into the, into the microphone with the understanding that it would be transmitted by the broadcaster and ultimately there'd be a recording of it somehow. Mm -hmm. The person who records it isn't necessarily the author. They, they're a scribe, essentially, acting at the direction of the author. So I would argue that Murrow owned that when it got fixed in some way. Unless Murrow worked for CBS, mm -hmm. if he was doing, if all of what he broadcast on CBS was, was work for hire, right. it might be owned by CBS, not the Murrow estate. But there yes. is ownership in that case. Yes. Thank you. Um, writing explicit uh, stage directions uh, that are considered uh, essentially stage directions, uh, which are very, very specific, which um, the author has, has required, um, can the author require that those stage directions be performed precisely as written? Of course they can. Oh, Beth, <laughs> let, 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 let Beth jump in. This one also gives me a lot of agita, um, because I, I spend a lot of time, especially in sort of the university world, where everybody, all the directors are taught, you know, black out all the stage directions, don't even read them, and I think, like, you know, I, I work with writers who sometimes spend years on plays. If you work with Bill Kane, you understand that those stage directions, you know, if you go through equivocation, or you go through nine circles, and you look for moments where he has crafted one character cradling another character in their arms. Those moments are incredibly specific. If there are moments of nudity in nine circles, they are incredibly specific. It's not simply, you know, this person crosses to the drinks cart and pours themselves a bourbon. I think that if we are seeking to honor author intent, stage directions matter. Do I agree that directors and designers and actors should be free in the rehearsal room to create and contribute? Of course. Here's the bottom line for me, and, and if as we're wrapping up, I can bang one drum. Mm -hmm. I was just in Boston for the annual conference of the literary managers and drum of the Americas, and I did a panel with Salisa Kalki from the Alliance and Rebecca Frank, who used to work at the Guild. Um, and it was on like dramaturgy and law, and I thought three people are gonna show up because <laughs> why do legend dramaturgs and literary managers care about copyright and legal issues? And the room was packed, and it was a group of people rabid for information because they are artist advocates and writers advocates who find themselves constantly in situations where they think, I might not, this might not be right, but I don't know what is right or wrong, and I don't know who to turn to, and I don't know what to do, except that I'm here to be an advocate for a writer, and I feel like the writer's intent is not being honored. And so I said this at the beginning of the panel, and I would say it again in relation to you, I'm assuming you're the writer of the play. Like, you exist. I'm looking at you. I suspect you have an email address. 
you may have a publisher, you may have a website, you may be listed on Dooley or Kanji or the National New Play Network's New Play Exchange. If I Googled you, I could probably find you in about 10 minutes. This was the thing we said on the panel. It's the thing I'll say here. Ask. Pick up the phone, have the director, the producer, and say, look, I'm used to a lot of contemporary plays, don't have a lot of stage directions, which is true. Your play has a lot of stage directions. Can I talk to you about the role of the stage directions in your play? And you can say, look, there's some things that if you didn't do them, it would break my heart. There are other things that we did that I think are really funny. If you can be funnier than that, God's <laughs> speed. But it gives them an opportunity to have a conversation with you or a conversation with me, because by and large, I'm very aware of what my author's intents are, or a conversation with the publisher to say, we want to do the right thing. We want to make changes. We're a Christian university. We can't show drinking on stage. Our audience has a strong reaction to swear words. There are a lot of swear words in this play. Just ask. We're here to facilitate. The publishers are here to facilitate. Attorneys are here to facilitate. Agents are here to facilitate. Designers will go out of their way to facilitate and make, make things work. If you're not sure if what you're doing is right, there's a really simple step to take. Ask somebody. And their intent, their, their desire to respect your intent is irrelevant unless you have the authority to enforce your intent. Mm -hmm. And enforcing your intent is what we're talking about. Today. It's about ownership of the problem mm -hmm. and protecting it. I think we have to let those be the final words. Um, a few announcements for the congregation. Um, <laughs> uh, I think we should, first of all, thank our panelists. Thank you for being here.